Welcome into another edition of Spits and Suds. Thank you so much for supporting us. I'm Gavin Spittle of 1053 The Fan. Unfortunately, it's another off-season edition as we get ready for the Stanley Cup final, game number one. Oh, it would be so awesome if we were there. But that doesn't mean we have to stop on Spits and Suds. In fact, we roll on. So much to talk about this off-season. And one of the things that happened the other day is exit interviews. And I always find exit interviews interesting because players are leaving and you can really gather a lot. A lot of times you can hear about their injuries, what they've been suffering from. Uh, They've met with coaches. And the other aspect that we're going to talk about today is will they stay or will they go? And the Stars specifically have two major unrestricted free agents in Matt Duchesne and Chris Tanev. So when we look at, let's start with Duchesne. Had a very good year. Awesome chemistry with Tyler Sagan and Mason Marchment. So the question is, will Matt Duchesne stay? And they asked him about that the other day. I'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I, of all the years I've lost out in the playoffs, this is easily the most disappointing and it feels almost like the season was a failure, but it's not really, it's the total opposite. I love that. Love that answer from Matt Duchesne. I didn't want to play the whole interview, but throughout the interview, he kept saying, we, we have a young core. We have a lot of things to look forward to. And that, to me, meant that he still wants to be a part of this team, and he has been a great team teammate. For instance, you could have easily said if you were in that position and you were Matt Duchesne, it's been a great year. It's been a lot of fun. We'll have to see what happens in the offseason. But he kept using we. I think Matt Duchesne really wants to be here. And in fact, one of the question marks in the playoffs was Matt Duchesne. Remember, this is a guy that only went to the second round of the NHL playoffs once with the Columbus Blue Jackets, a team that he was traded to, who he wasn't there for the whole year. So this is a totally new experience for the NHL veteran. And one of the other things that they asked him about and he kind of opened up about was maybe this is the reason that we didn't see what we saw during the regular season with Matt Duchesne. And I have to be honest with you, I can totally see why this happened with Matt Duchesne when you hear this answer. I mean, I kind of talked about it with the coaches this morning. I, I lose the end of my finger in March last year. I have three surgeries. I get kind of blindsided and, and end up a free agent sign here. I'm here three days later looking for a house, trying to figure that out. Um, I got three kids at home. I fly here. I fly there. I start camp, new teammates, new system, new coaches, new everything. I think it kind of hit me a little bit and kind of caught up with me uh, about 60 games in. Um, and, you know, I'm still sorting through some of those emotions and those things. I, you know, I'm a human being at, the, you know, at the end of the day. And, um, I was kind of running like a robot there for about, I would say probably eight, eight, nine months. So, um, I, I really wanted to, to win this year. I felt like it was a, a special year and a year that we could win. And I think that would have helped a lot of, you know, some of those things I'm sorting through, but you know, it's not the case. And you know, I'm looking forward to just slowing things down, hopefully now this summer and, and taking a breath. So athletes are elite and we put them on a pedestal, but sometimes we forget, like he said in the quote, is that he's human. And picture yourself going through two surgeries and healing from an injury. And then all of a sudden your job says, we don't want you anymore. So you're unemployed. I get it. These people make millions of dollars. Matt Duchesne has made a lot of money. But it still hurts when an organization that you signed a long-term deal with has said, we no longer want you, especially when Matt Duchesne put up pretty good numbers for them. So that happens. So you're injured, you're healing, and then all of a sudden, the team that you've put your roots down and you signed a long-term contract, so that means your family moved with you. So now, all of a sudden, you're looking for a new house in a new city on the fly. And then you have a whole new system to get used to. And you're playing with 
all new teammates. Yes, there was a relationship there with Tyler Sagan, and that certainly helped. And I'm sure he knew a couple of the other players. It's great that they had some veterans that could welcome him. But it's a whirlwind. And when you go through that whirlwind, like he said, you kind of become a a robot, and adrenaline kind of takes over. And Matt Duchesne, through those 60 games, was an absolute steal in free agency. Like, we were lauding Jim Nill. And then he might have hit that wall. And, yes, he had a massive overtime goal to clinch uh, after he probably should have been. (laughs) There's no way that he should have been called in the crease. So karma and redemption for Matt Duchesne. So all that happened and just probably didn't have the best series against Edmonton, but maybe just the tank was on empty for many of these stars players because such a brutal gauntlet to go through facing Las Vegas and Colorado back to back Stanley cup champs. That's really, really tough. So I like that from Duchesne because it puts it in perspective because I know we were wondering, And obviously, everyone's injured this time of year. Everyone's banged up. But at the same time, when you hear what Duchesne went through prior and then during the season, you can understand where he's coming from. But once again, in that quote, he used we. I think Matt Duchesne really wants to come back here. And with the Joe Pavelski retirement, I think the stars should lean toward bringing him back if it's a fair contract for both sides. Let's see what's out there. I don't think Matt Duchesne will be overpaid by somebody, and I'm not saying this in a negative way, but you do have an over 30-year-old player. So that's going to be taken into consideration with several teams. So if the Stars can work out a great deal, he's made a lot of money in this league, I think Matt Duchesne wants to stay here. To me, the most important person in the offseason, the sign is going to be Chris Tanev. You saw the difference in Jake Ottinger's save percentage, goals against. Jake Ottinger even admitted it. Since Chris Tanev has arrived, have you seen my stats? And that says a lot when your goalie is immediately giving credit to one defenseman when there are six on the ice. Chris Tanev meant so much to this team. He means a ton to the room. He quickly... Like, notice when he arrived, the shot blocking and how it became contagious. That's Chris Tanev. As he said during this, in the exit interview, there was no way he was going to miss more games. I think signing Chris Tanev is your number one priority. I know the offense went dry, but at the same time, I don't think you would have made it that far in the NHL playoffs without Chris Tanev. Once again, an NHL veteran, I think you can get him on a lesser deal. The salary cap is going up. The Stars do have a penalty and overage to pay. So we have to take that into consideration next year. They will have money to spend, and I think you have to bring Tanev back. I'd love to see him for three or four years. He really means a lot. So the question is, does Tanif want to return to Dallas? Yeah, I had a great time here. Um, organization treated me treated me awesome. Uh, coaches were great. I, I learned a lot. Um, it was a great journey. Um, it's, it's obviously not ended how we wanted to, but you you learn from that and um, you know, think about a lot this summer and, and and how to get better and and how do you get to that next level. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I hopefully I'm. I'm able to stay here at a, a great time. My family had a great time here. So we'll see how that goes. I mean, it's still, still obviously really early. We're sort of still trying to get over uh, losing. And I mean, I think we all hope for, for a better outcome. Let's give a lot of credit to the Stars organization. From the top to the bottom, Jim Nill and his staff, the training staff, all aspects of the organization. These are two guys that came from other organizations. You look at Tanif, he's played in two massive hockey situations in Vancouver and Calgary. 
and then playing in America on a regular basis for the first time, for him to say, yeah, it would be great, that says a lot because he's going to be a premium free agent. Now, whether or not he stays, obviously money is going to be a massive factor. Hopefully the Texas state tax puts a couple million back on or, you know, whatever the the tax bracket you can. But players like playing here in Dallas, and that is a massive stick tap to Jim Nill, to the coaches, to the entire organization. Because listen to what Tanif said, made his wife and family feel right at home. Those little things add up. When you don't have to worry about your wife, when you don't have to worry about your kid, and you can concentrate on hockey knowing that they're in a good place, knowing that you won't receive text messages, and you could just concentrate on the great game, that is just so much less stress on you. And hopefully Tanif and his camp take that into consideration. I think he fit well into the scheme of Pete DeBoer. I think he liked the coaching staff, and I think he liked the training staff. So I can't wait until July, and I hope they can get a deal done. I hope it can be a multi-year deal, not just because it made Jake Ottinger better. We saw a different Essa Lindell, and Essa Lindell's deal is going to come up soon, but at the same time, he was a completely different player. Think of Essa Lindell when he was paired with Ryan Suter in last year's playoffs against Vegas. And then Essa Lindell paired with Chris Tanev. And that's not a knock on Ryan Suter, but that's how good Chris Tanev is. And yeah, we have to take into consideration that basically he was almost playing on one leg. So probably in the final couple of games, we did not get 100% Chris Tanev. But what a warrior and what a guy that I would absolutely love to have here for many years to come. So the other day, Sean and I were about to jump on, and I asked you guys for questions, and you guys responded. And then the news of Joe Pavelski taking the year off from hockey slash retiring. I'm doing that because I want to be factually accurate. He is not formally announced being retired, but he said he will not play hockey next year. So obviously we wanted to concentrate on that, and therefore we didn't get to your questions, but... I never want to leave you guys hanging because your Twitter slash X support has been absolutely amazing. Love after games when I said opinions, questions, and you guys fire away. That is so cool. It really fills up the show in a good way. And then when I ask for the Frosties and you guys are sending me pictures of Frosties, I love that we can activate this podcast in different ways. First, I want to give a massive stick tap to Fuzzy. Fuzzy Wuzzy Boom Boom is a big Twitter follower, and I've been over his house, watched some stars. It was great. Fuzzy last night, it was spray paint the ice, and Fuzzy put a Spitz and Suds logo and sent it to me. I retweeted it at GJ Spittle. I love that activation. I love when you guys comment on Apple or Spotify as far as what you like about the program. That's activation. When you guys send in your comments, that's activation. When you guys send frosty pictures, and remember, a frosty can be a beer, it could be whatever you want, it could be water, it could be a soda, doesn't matter. The fact is, you're holding up a nice glass and you're saying cheers. And I absolutely love the teamwork on that. And then the other aspect is, is you guys have shocked me with all the places across this amazing world that you guys are listening to Spits and Suds. That absolutely fires me like a fourth liner ready to come over the boards. It is amazing. Australia, Switzerland, Italy, England, Portland, Pittsburgh. I'm forgetting so many places, but I have so many places I want to visit because I want to talk hockey with you. So you can always hit me up at GJ Spittle. If I'm not following you, you know, ping me and I'll be sure to follow you back. So let's start with Michael Moore. He asks, rumor has it, Trevor Zegras is on the block. Could the Stars afford to get involved? Great young talent. He feel, uh, I feel as though he'd fit in great. So as far as a contract, the Anaheim Ducks current winger makes $5.75 million for the next two years, this upcoming year and the year after. After that, he is a restricted free agent. 
And Zegras played in 31 games this year. I think he had 15 points. Yeah. Six goals, nine assists, minus one on the ice. The talent is there. I just don't know if that's a priority to add a $6 million guy like that. Amazing stick handler. And they don't come around often. But you look at his stats, 61 points, 65 points. I mean, it's really good. But is that the top priority, my man? And I, I think when it comes down to top priority, first is TANF. But remember, you have Maverick Bork coming up. And I think that's going to fill your offensive void. I need to see what Maverick Bork does. If I bring in Zegris, who am I getting rid of? Because there, while there is cap space, there isn't too much. Sure, a trade could happen. But let's just throw this out because Jason Robertson's from that area. Do you want to trade Jason Robertson for Trevor Zegers? Because that would make sense salary-wise, but I'd rather keep Robertson. I think Robertson's a better all-around player, and I think Robertson's proven it for longer. But what are you going to give up? Because it's probably going to be more than a first-round pick. Just based on the talent. So I would say no, or if I go in, I'm going in conservatively uh, on Zegras. Offense wasn't a problem during the regular season. It's the playoffs that just got shut down. The question is, is it because, you know, did the Mason Marchman injury, you know, did that hurt? Uh, Joe Pavelski, we just heard from Duchesne. There were a lot of contributors during the regular season that just could not come up, whether it was injury-related or just were not scoring against Edmonton. The tank ran dry. Wasuko writes, we'll definitely miss Joe Pavelski, not just on the rink, a truly remarkable person. Absolutely agree with you. Um, he, he did so much on and off the ice. We've told the story about sitting in Jason Robertson's room for 30 minutes late at night, making sure he was okay, got the heads up, that Essa Lindell was a little bit down after a game, found out the room, went down, talked to Essa for another 30 minutes. I mean, Joe Pavelski, that is absolutely amazing. I mean, he was a captain in San Jose and a pseudo-captain here. And Jamie Benn absolutely loved having him around. Michael also asked, so McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Hyman have been a three-headed monster all year. Our team was built on depth, but at the end of the day, it was superstars that won it. Do we need a superstar? It's a really good question. I don't think we need a superstar because who is the superstar on Florida? That would be Kachuk. But is he among like the superstar names? Is he Matthews? Is he uh, McDavid? Is he Crosby? Is he Ovechkin? Probably around a second tier. But then where do you put, like, a Jason Robertson? Because he'd kind of be around those tiers. How about Rupe Hintz? There's an argument to be made that Rupe Hintz was one of the best forwards in the NHL this year. When healthy and went on the ice, Rupe Hintz is one of the tops in the league. And that's talked about nationally, not just here on Spits and Suds. The question is, is can he stay on the ice? And it's not his fault. I mean, the injury he took was you know, based on the cross-check. Ryan Gen X, sports nerd, says, Steve Spots, the assistant coach of the Stars, failing in years past on the power play in the playoffs with Vegas. I know they are a package deal, Spot and Pete DeBoer, but come on, he's outcoached on the power play in the playoffs. It's a trend. And he says, and buy out Suter. I cannot see someone signing, um... Well, you wouldn't re-sign Suter. Suter has one year left. If you bought Suter out, another year is extended, and it's half of his current deal. So does it make sense? Yeah, I could see that if you need cap space. But Ryan Suter did not have a good series against Edmonton. Completely agree. But I actually think Ryan Suter was a really good third-pairing defenseman this year. We're talking about a third pairing, not to mention Ryan Suter 
played next to a carnival rotation of defensemen. And we just take that for granted. It wasn't like it was Suter and. It was Suter and Haskinen. It was Suter and Harley. It could be Suter and Tanef. So they were rotating. So I personally think Ryan Suter should play out his contract here in Dallas unless you tell me that that buyout is getting me something premium. Because here's the thing. You have Liam Bixell potentially playing next year. So let's say you sign Tanif. So I can go Haskinen, Harley. Ultimately, by the way, I would love to go Haskinen, Tanif because I want to see Miro play on his strong side. I just want to see it. We really have not seen Miro play on his strong side. Craig Ludwig said, you know, does it really matter? I will take Craig's thoughts since he played 17 years in the league. However, I just want to see it. So even if you did that and you put Harley with Lindell and then that third pairing, you put Suter with Bixel, that's pretty good. You really improved yourself. And if Bixel proves that he's playing really well defensively, you could move him up. I know it's crazy. But I want to keep Ryan Suter around one more year. Sky Maverick 21, best lineups. Everyone has different opinions, but I have a feeling we had this lineup. We would go 82 and 0. <laughs> Absolutely, my man. Rope, Robo, Wyatt Johnston, Duchesne, Sagan, Mush, Mason Marchman, Logan Stankoven, Ben, Bork, Steele, Foxa, Delandria. Slash off-season pickup. Okay. Uh, he has Tanif Harley, Lindell Bixel, Suter as a great seventh. I got news for you. I, I, I can't afford Ryan Suter as my um, seventh defenseman. I, I can't. So, and he has a free agent pickup uh, pairing with Miro. I mean, it is a good lineup. It would be interesting because... I would like to see a bigger defenseman paired with Miro. You know what combo I really liked was Jamie Alexiak paired with Miro. I just want Miro to feel free offensively knowing that a defensive defenseman is sitting back. I just feel as though Miro has to have that defensive mind, and Miro's a terrific defenseman. But at the same time, I just want to see like free Miro, what that's like. Brian Tatum says, Sean has often said, maybe jokingly, that the slow starts trace back through the Ben captaincy era. Does it start with the captain? Is it just reflected in his personality somehow, maybe too calm? Are there other less obvious but important team traits that come from captains? It's a great question. They do coincide with each other, but Ben has been here a long time. They have to figure out how to rile the troops up early. I mean... That game one loss finally cost them against Edmonton. I really felt as though they were playing catch up from there. And yes, they took a two to one series lead. Personally, I would love to see an acquisition that provides energy on the ice. I want to see a guy full tilt. And one of the things that I think the Stars got caught up in was a little bit too one dimensional speed and scoring. Not necessarily versatility as far as, I'll use Vegas as an example, and yes, they got knocked out by the Stars. I get it. But when they went on that Stanley Cup run, they could shut you down defensively. Their goaltender could steal a game. They could play really physical with you, or they could score a bunch of goals against you. I just didn't see the physicality. And I know many of you are saying, come on, Gavin, that's overrated. I don't think in the playoffs it is, guys. I think you have to be physical. Hello, we from Italy checks in. Normally, I don't agree with your point about size and physicality, but I have to admit it's really important coming playoff time. You also have to think the new core at forwards is really undersized. Johnston, Stankoven, Maverick, Bork. Ben is getting older and older, and I think Brady could make this final steps to superstar like Matt did when leaving Canada. 
imagining Kachuk and Wyatt on the same line. Now, if you're telling me that Brady Kachuk could come here to Dallas, I am 100% in, and you name me the player I'm trading, and I'm serious about that. People would say, you're absolutely crazy. Jason Robertson for Brady Kachuk, I'd do it. Rupe Hintz for Brady Kachuk, I'd do it. Here's why I would do it with Hintz. Because with Rupe Hintz, I have, if I bring back Duchesne, I have Maverick Bork at center, I have Wyatt Johnston as center. So the Stars have enough centers. Now, do I want to trade Rope Hintz? Absolutely not. No. But you're getting Brady Kachuk, who, like Matthew, is absolutely a beast in front of the net, is physical, but can score. You need that in your lineup. It just has to be more than finesse. Ryan Gen X also says, Gensel, Stamkos, someone like Stevenson for speed. Uh, he mentions a couple other players. Um, seems like a, and he talks about like acquiring. I, I hope the stars are buyers and I hope the stars get the missing pieces. My friends, Martin Crooms, is there someone else from Cedar park who we should keep an eye on for potentially stepping up or providing more depth? Blumel, Cairo, Poirier, Murray. I like Matt Murray a lot. I was actually a little disappointed in the season that Matt Murray had. Um, you know, when he comes up, I think he looks really good. I think Matt Murray can play a backup role in the NHL. I feel pretty good about that. I don't know if the organization feels the same way. I will say Scott Wedgwood is either going to receive a raise from this organization or someone else is going to go out and get him. Because backup goalies become more and more valuable and Scott Wedgwood had an excellent year. And teams are going to look at the Jake Ottinger injury and when Scott Wedgwood came in and that the team kept winning. That is major currency for Scott Wedgwood's camp. Big Rob, 409. For the life of me, I can't understand why the Stars didn't pepper the net more and more and more every game. Way too pass happy with Skinner, who grew more and more confident each game. Coaching and full team effort led them down, not necessarily their rock stars. Um, yeah, I I agree. Um, I I like to pepper the net a lot. I like to get in front of the net. The only problem with that final game, and I think the Stars were the better team, is you look at the number of shots from the outside, and the Stars really could not get in tight. So when you look at high-quality chances, they were minimal. And that's the statistic you want to look at, high-quality chances. Adam Deacon chimes in for uh, from across the pond in England. Afternoon, chaps. Taking a couple of days to process the outcome of the series. Hurts like hell. Keep up the great work as I like to expand on my hockey IQ over the offseason. Listen into your cast. Thank you so much. Stick tap to you, Adam. George McLean asked, do you feel as though the Stars were playing not to take penalties or did they just run out of gas? The physical edge was not there versus Edmonton whatsoever. I'm guessing that it was a gas thing, but... I do think that they were leery of taking penalties based on Edmonton as far as how easily they were scoring on the power play. It's one thing to score on the power play, but remember how quick Edmonton was scoring on the power play. So that's why I'm going to keep my eye on this Florida-Edmonton series to see how did Florida or can they neutralize uh, Edmonton. That's going to be big, and I think, you know, probably the Stars need to look at that as well. Jordan H. from Canada, would you consider a major trade? Yes, I would. Example being Florida, I'm fearful this team is going to become the San Jose Sharks. Lots of playoff runs, always falling short. That is a question that entered my mind. Now, there's falling short, and then there's the Western Conference Finals. Like, if you're asking me, do I feel as though this was a successful year? I think it's fair to call it a successful year, but a disappointment as well. You took down two Stanley Cup champions. You won the Central Division. You were the top seed overall. You got taken down by a team that since January has been absolutely 
on fire. Best team in the NHL. And they took you down. And that's okay. Uh, you just have to regroup and get better. And that's going to be, it's a massive offseason for Jim Nill and crew. How, to me, you can't run the same crew back. You cannot run the same crew back. You have to figure out what is the missing piece and then go after it. If it doesn't work, at least you tried. Tim, at Farmer Runs, what do you think happens with the possible Duchesne re-sign? And will we actually make an offer to Lundquist since he's such a liability, or do you think we could develop into more of an asset? Personally, I think Nils Lundquist, you should not do a qualifying offer. Let him become an unrestricted free agent. Let him sign overseas. I, I just don't. It It's not worth it. The experiment needs to end. The fact that you're playing five defensemen, okay? The fact that you're rotating in the playoffs because you don't want to see him minus four minutes a game, and then you call up a guy from Texas who plays the remaining games. So when the opportunity to go back in was there, you didn't get the call. I just don't see how all of a sudden you can recover from that next season. So. I'd use the money um, and maybe get a veteran defenseman if you can or somebody else. Um, the Stars need every dollar. So, to me, I think let Nils Lundqvist sign with another team or go overseas. Samson, at Samson Dustin, asks, any chance we flip some assets in a trade or sign a game-breaking right wing to replace Pavs on the top line? Maybe Marner could find his playoff game outside of the pressure of Toronto. I mean, Mitch Marner's a beast. Um, but at the same time, I don't think the Stars need to go that far as far as I don't want the $7 million a year because, understand, you need to look ahead. You have to do a Thomas Harley deal. He's restricted this year. You have to do a Wyatt Johnston deal, which might happen in this offseason, but, you know, Wyatt Johnston's up after next year. Once again, a restricted free agent so the Stars can match any offers. But at the same time, you have to protect your young assets. So I think for a few million, you could probably get a couple of really nice assets that are going to pay dividends. Using this as an example, Corey Perry. Look what he did in that Edmonton series when he came in. And Corey Perry's kind of a different cat when Corey Perry signs with the team. A lot of times they go to the Stanley Cup. It might be coincidence, but at the same time, Those Maroons, those Perrys, those guys can make difference. And you know what? They're million dollar contracts. So that's the direction I would like to go see. You know, see the stars. I want them to play Bixel. I want them to play Maverick Bork, give them seasoning. And that also opens up more money so you can go out. But I personally, unless they make a trade, I don't want a seven to nine million dollar player right now. I actually kind of want to get, I still want to be effective. And I want to pick up players that can pull you over the top, but I also don't want to be cap-strapped like it seems like the Stars have been um, in years past. Jason Rosenbaum, now that our big three prospects are almost certain to all have jobs in Dallas day one, are there any other prospects we need, should be paying close attention to or get excited for? I think Murray and Goals really interesting. Uh, let's see about that. I think Gavin White is an interesting defenseman. Um, you know, and, and let's see, and let's see who they uh, 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 draft this year as well. So, um, you know, the prospects will keep coming based on the um, latest, what they've done in the draft the last few years. I mean, we weren't really talking about Liam Bixel, um, you know, until what we saw in Traverse City and that he was going to be effective. So, therefore, I, I think, you know, let's look at the prospect camp. Let's see how guys are doing a little early to talk about that but you know it is a system that is rich right now and yeah those players are coming up but that's a great thing Matthew Martin feel like Vegas and Colorado really took the biggest chunks out of the stars I remember watching breakdowns about how our forecheck gave them trouble and it seemed really nearly non-existent against the Oilers can't think of a question but looking forward to y'all's off-season content thank you so much Matt no I appreciate the opinion I completely agree with you the forecheck went away if Dallas is to improve on something next year, got to be the power play, obviously. But another thing that I don't think was talked about, the lack of forecheck against Edmonton. They didn't put enough pressure on those Edmonton defensemen. 
They needed to neutralize the speed. And one way to neutralize the speed is a lot more time in the end, cause some uh, in the Edmonton end, cause some turnovers and really create that 20 to 30 second window. Even if you can't mount on something that Edmonton's too tired and it neutralizes their speed. So um, Edmonton did a great job getting out of their zone, man. They were fast getting out of their zone uh, zone, kind of like the stars were in the first couple of rounds when they were effective avoiding uh, the Vegas deep four check and the Colorado deep four check. Um, Dart says, how would you like to see the lines change for next year? Uh, be more too heavy, or I guess he's saying be more heavy. I'm always in favor of being a little bit more heavy. I do think the stars lack of size can hurt them at times. I think if Bixel gets reinserted or inserted into the lineup defensively, that gives you a lot of size. Uh, so let's see. Maverick Bork's not a big guy, but he does play bigger than his size, similar to Stankoven. Very water bug like. And we cannot judge Maverick Bork on one game in Chicago and then a game six in which I don't even think he saw over 10 minutes and he's playing on the fourth line. So. It'll be exciting to see Maverick Bork go through an entire training camp knowing that he's going to be on this Stars team and where they put him and how they match him up. If Duchesne comes back, yes, it will be awesome to see Duchesne, Marchment, and Sagan together. That would be awesome. Question comes in uh, from supporter of the DFW Wyatts. Uh, I do think Pete DeBoer, 0-5 record in his last five conference finals where his side has been the favorite in four of those series and lost in six games or less, deserves a deep dive. I think he's been Jim Nill's best coaching hire by far, but there's clearly an issue once he gets to the conference finals. It's not just the power play futility. The game one loss and earlier rounds are making for longer series that may be taking more out of the stars than we realize. Uh, I'll give compliments to Pete DeBoer in these areas. I love his calmness. I love how former players love him. I love that his teammates currently love him. Now, all that can change if the Stars get off to a slow start, which I don't expect. But yeah, those are aspects that they need to work on as a team. Power play and get off to quicker starts. I understand the 0-5 conference finals, but I could also counter how is he in Game 7. And Game 7 should be the most stressful uh, situation. He's one of the best all time in sports. So maybe both can be coincidence. I'm just going to throw that out there. I think when you take your team to a central division title, when you take your team to two conference finals, you deserve a little slack on that rope. And I think Pete DeBoer has earned that. And let's see what they do next year. If they can't get over the hump next year, I'm willing to have a conversation. But there were some people on Twitter that said, Gavin, get rid of Pete DeBoer. I'm not ready to do that. I can't do that based on the chemistry he has with this team, uh, based on the moves that he made during the playoffs that were successful, especially when you look at the reinsertion of Delandria into the fourth line. When you look at some of these moves, because these are tough coaching decisions, um, you know, and you could criticize, I guess, the Pavelski, like keeping him up with his minutes. Maybe he should have moved down to the fourth line. But any coach's decisions certainly can be criticized. But I think he played his goalies throughout the season really well as far as who plays when. I thought he gave Jake Ottinger the rest. I thought he was very confident in his goaltender. I loved how he played him after a loss and said Jake is one of the best back um, back-to-back back goalies that I've been around as far as rebounding. He always comes up big. And if you saw in those games, Ottinger had a lot more confidence and did come up big. Oleg says, Suter buyout seems like a layup this year, right? Can you see a scenario where they do a one-year managed workload contract with Pavs? Nope, we're past that point. Um, and that's basically you know, what he's talking about. And I've made it mention, I know it's not a popular opinion. I am fine with Ryan Suter closing out his career as a Dallas star uh, next year, because I actually think Ryan Suter played well. Um, And, you know, that Edmonton series did not play well. But other than that, um, I think he, I think he played well. 
Uh, and I think that's about it for your questions. So really, really appreciate it. Um, one of the things we pride ourselves on is guests here on Spits and Suds. Uh, we are going to have Taylor Baird on. Um, she had to cancel. Um, she's got a lot going on right now. The NHL.com reporter who did an amazing job throughout the season. So we're going to get Taylor on. We're going to have some more guests, but I wanted to pop on, answer some of your questions before it was too long. Talk about Chris Tanneth. Talk about Matt Duchesne. Wanted to give your, uh, give you my thoughts. So once again, if you don't mind, uh, tell everyone about Spits and Suds and tell everyone that there is some hockey off-season programming. Sean's going to come back on here. We're going to talk about the NHL draft. And even if you're not like an NHL draft person, I encourage you to listen because we're going to dive into some names to make you more knowledgeable about the NHL draft. There's also a lot of trades that happen um, around the NHL for picks. So we'll also talk about that. And then we have free agency right around the corner. There's so many things to talk about. So thank you so much for listening and supporting Spits and Suds. We'll have another episode for you soon, I promise. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great day.